So for those of you that don't know me, which I'm sure most of you do, um, my name is Gina Hurst. I'm one of the six years I'm an EMI and critical care um, fellow. And the talk that I was um, uh, requested to do for this month is on uh, intravenous fluid therapy in the ICU, which I think is appropriate because in the spring I gave a lecture on fluid responsiveness, so why not talk about what type of fluids to give after we found out whether or not a patient's fluid responsive. Um, so the objectives of this talk are going to be a few. Um, number one, talk about the goals that we have of the IV fluid therapy that we're providing our patients with, review the types of fluids and availabilities that we have here at Henry Ford Hospital, understand the concept of balanced solutions, and then discuss the potential effects that hyperchloremia may have on the critically ill. So IV fluids. It's pretty common that you'll walk into a room and you'll see a picture that looks uh, not dissimilar to this one. Somebody's sitting in a bed and they have an IV in with fluids either going at a KVO or running at a maintenance rate. And it's probably not something that we think about on a regular basis. What type of fluid am I giving my patient? How much are they getting? It's just so your, you know, your resident tells you I have them on maintenance at 100 an hour and you just accept that as a fact. Um, but what are we really doing? Um, Dr. Michael Winters, who I had the privilege of hearing at ASAP a year ago, um, had a very strong opinion on the fact that fluids are drugs. And I think most of us would agree with that, but we don't necessarily say that out loud to each other or to the residents um, or uh, fellows that we're teaching. Um, why is that important? So it's important because anytime I give a medication to somebody, I'm asking myself, some questions. Now, is this going to be efficacious for the therapy that I'm trying to deliver? Um, does this drug that I'm giving this patient have a predictable response? Um, what's the side effect profile? Is this medication that I'm giving to this patient going to be safe for them? Um, is it suitable for the patient, whether it's co-administered with other medications? Is it easy for them to get access to this medication or for me to give them this medication? And is it costly? So we ask, we don't, we ask ourselves that medication with, you know, or with a lot of medications, we don't ask ourselves these questions when we're necessarily giving IV fluids. And I want to argue that it's important that we do. Um, so when we talk about medications, you know, if you have a patient that you're starting on an antihypertensive, uh, you're going to ask yourself, what's the indication for this medication? Okay, this person's blood pressure is high, so the indication is hypertension. Um, and then you're going to begin to ask yourself, what sort of type of medication do I want to put them on based on their milieu? And these same questions need to be asked about IV fluid therapy. So indication, what is my therapeutic goal with the IV fluid therapy that I'm delivering to my patient. For the purpose of this talk, I want to focus on large volume resuscitation. In the ICU, we see this most commonly in distributive shock and hypovolemic shock. This can also be true in prolonged operating um, uh, procedures, as well as any situation in which a patient would require a large volume of resuscitation. I'm just choosing these two particular clinical states because they seem most applicable to us where we work. The goal of my therapy when delivering the IV fluids is to restore volume to the patient who's lost volume and to maintain homeostasis. So ideally, the type of fluid I would choose in order to do that is going to be close to the composition of the circulating plasma because it's clearly lost or distributed into my interstitium, so I need to replace it, and that's what I want to do. For the purpose of this lecture, I'm not going to be talking about dosing, but it is something that you do have to consider when you're delivering IV fluid therapy. So what is our plasma look like? What composition do we want our patients to receive, ideally? Um, we have different compartments in our, in our uh, body, and all of us are familiar with these or should be familiar um, with these various compartments and what uh, cations and anions are present in them. Now, plasma, which is... Uh, here all the way on the left of the screen is predominant um, cation is sodium and predominant anion is chloride. And then you have other phospholipids, lactate, bicarb, etc., cetera, um, as well as protein that are balancing out these positive cations. Ideally, we should be able to deliver uh, fluid to a patient that's similar to that. Unfortunately, though, we don't often have access to those fluids. So what do we have? Um, looking at in different types of intravenous fluids, we're going to look here at the 
pl our plasma solution and then compare it to the different types of solutions that we have available. Um, the uh, three columns that are in kind of that mauve-ish color are colloids and then in the black are crystalloids. So looking at our colloid solution, so dextran kind of is, you know, falls under the head of starch is what we commonly know it as. Um, gelatin and albumin are all different types of colloids that can be used for resuscitation. And we'll talk about the benefits of using those or not using those um, in, uh, shortly. Uh, Dextran is something that we have available at our hospital, except we never use it and it's just in the cardiac operating rooms um, and they use it for volume expansion, um, but very rarely ever used. Um, it is just a plant colloid that is uh, dissolved in a solution of sodium chloride. Gelatin is very similar, but it's, a, it's an animal protein that's dissolved in a sodium chloride solution. Um, what we're all more familiar with is 5% albumin, which in a liter of 5% albumin, you're also dissolving that in sodium chloride. So you're getting a significant amount of sodium chloride uh, milliequivalent load every time you're giving a patient 5% albumin. Again, something that we don't necessarily think about when we're administering these fluids. More commonly in the ICU, we're used to resuscitating our uh, septic patients with normal saline, occasionally Ringer's lactate. Um, we do have plasmolite in this institution as well, but again, it's usually uh, more predominantly used in the operating rooms and uh, not often present uh, and available to us in the ICU, although it is available if you call pharmacy. Now, the major difference um, between normal saline and the, re the rest of these um, uh, crystalloid solutions is that um, these uh, Ringer's lactate, Hartman's plasmolite, they all have anions that are present in them. So they have acetate or gluconate or lactate that are present in the fluid. And this allows the fluid, when it's in the bag, to have an in vitro osmolarity that's similar to your serum osmolarity. But as soon as these, these IV fluids end up in the bloodstream, these anions get metabolized, and then what you're actually giving is a hypotonic solution, which is why I um, highlighted these osmolarities in red, because when it really comes down to it, your osmolarity that you're delivering is closer to 250, 260 when you're giving these balanced solutions. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, why that may or may not be helpful to us. So what I want to talk about first, once now that we understand the types of fluids that are available, um, is number one, colloidal resuscitation, and then number two, crystalloid resuscitation. And I think most of us know the research on colloidal resuscitation, and that's not really the goal of my talk. So I just want to touch on it really quickly, and then we're going to move away from that. So um, head of starch, the reason that we don't use it is because a lot of the studies that have been done show that it's out of favor. Um, the two largest studies that are referred to most commonly are the 6S trial, which was published in uh, New England Journal of Medicine in 2012, comparing head of starch to lactated ringers for resuscitation. That showed increased need for renal replacement therapy and uh, increased 90-day mortality. Um, chest, which was another um, head of starch versus normal saline, showed evidence of increased um, need for renal replacement therapy as well. So m most people um, would tend to agree that head of starch is, does more harm than good in the setting of volume resuscitation. So we generally don't use it. The FDA hasn't approved it for use in the United States because of these studies. Um, colloidal resuscitation with albumin has its, you could lecture on this or have a whole controversy on this for days. Um, we know from Safe and Crystal that as far as we can tell, albumin is fine to use as a resuscit resuscitative fluid, but there are other things like cost and potentially um, uh, um, uh, mortality associated with the delivery of albumin. Something to think about. Um, so we've talked about colloid, we've talked about crystalloid, but I kind of want to delve deeper into these crystalloid solutions that we're giving our patients. Um, I want to talk first about normal saline. So 
we walk by these bags every single day and we don't think about what's in them. We just prescribe them and we move on with our day. We can walk into a room and say, give them three liters of normal saline and leave and not think, what could this be doing to the patient? What is the medication that I'm giving to this patient? So normal saline um, was actually invented in the 1800s. They had this you know, huge cholera epidemic that's going on. They need to replace volume and they need to replace it with some sort of salt solution. So this Dutch scientist sat down, threw a bunch of salt water on different um, red blood cells and said, okay, at 0.9%, these cells aren't lysing. So this is safe to give. And that was about the extent of the research that he did on that particular medication. Um, and we have begun to accept it. During that same time, Dr. Lada and Ringers and all of these other people that were coming up with similar solutions were making these more balanced solutions with bicarb and a lot more you know, technically difficult solutions, but they just didn't catch on. And I don't know why historically. It's probably just because it's easy to throw some sodium chloride in a solution of water and make something to deliver to your patients. Um, the, the drawback to this medication, despite the fact that it's been so widely accepted, is number one, it's a quite acidotic medication, so the pH is five and a half to six, as well as it just doesn't have a physiologic ion content and doesn't have any buffering capabilities. Compare that to the other solutions that we have, such as Ringer's lactate or Hartman solution or plasmolite, which have organic ions and they have capabilities to buffer when you put these um, uh, solutions in the bloodstream. Additionally, um, as I mentioned before, their uh, osmolarity is a little bit lower. And the reason that this may be useful is because when the body is seeing this hypotonic solution that's being introduced, it actually allows ADH to continue to be released, and some people argue that that improves renal perfusion. Now, those are still kind of experimental studies and theories that people have going on, um, but it is something that uh, will be more interesting as we go along and talk about what we're seeing uh, in vitro and in vivo um, with various uh, crystalloid and colloid solutions. So the um, first area that I want to talk about is just why balanced solutions. And there are two, there are many, many studies about this. And over the past five to 10 years, it's kind of been an explosion of all sorts of evaluations of the types of fluid that we're giving um, our patients. And I'm going to bring up two um, pretty salient studies, and then we'll go through a couple others to just to talk about why this is applicable. So there was uh, a study that was done by a gentleman named Dr. Uh, Raghunathan, I believe is how you pronounce his name, um, in critical care medicine. And he looked at um, patients that had received balanced fluids versus patients that had received um, normal saline. Now, this was uh, at you know, over 360 in institutions. There was about 50,000 people who fell into his criteria. About 4,000 of those patients actually were resuscitated with balanced solutions as compared to normal saline. So the majority of these patients received large volume resuscitation for sepsis with normal saline, and a small cohort of them received balanced solutions. He compared these groups of people with a propensity matched cohort, saying, let me look at these people that were resuscitated with balanced solutions, compare that the, them to these people that were resuscitated with normal saline, and see if there was any difference in their outcomes. Unfortunately, when he was looking at this group of people that were resuscitated with balanced solutions, None of them were 100% resuscitated with balanced solutions, and actually the majority of them, less than f the, the majority of the percentage of balanced solutions was like less than 40%. So some people were given like 20 to 40% of the amount of solution was balanced, or 40 to 60% of the amount of uh, solution that they received were balanced, but none of them received full resuscitation with balanced solutions. So it's basically what he's comparing is balanced solution plus some saline compared to full saline resuscitation. And what he found was that there was a significant difference in the absolute in-hospital mortality of these patients. Um, so the percentage, although it doesn't seem that significant, 19.6 to 22.8, was actually a very significant per, uh, 
percentage in regards to mortality with an associated relative risk reduction of 0 0.86, which is pretty significant because that means that for every 31 patients that you're resuscitating with balanced fluid, you have one less death. So for every 30 people, you save a life, and that's pretty cool. What's more interesting, though, is that the amount of balanced fluids that were given to these patients actually correlates with improvement in mortality. So he divided these people up into quintiles, and he said, let me look at the people with 0 to 20% of balanced fluids, 20 to 40% of balanced fluid, 40 to 60% of balanced fluids, and see over the course of this time, if I'm giving them more balanced fluids, does it have any effect on the likelihood that they'll survive? And indeed, it did. What he found was that there was a relative risk reduction of 3.4% for every 10% increase in a balanced solution resuscitation. So the more balanced solution you receive during your resuscitation, the, the less chance you have to suffer in hospital mortality. I um, mean, this is one of the, one of the first um, studies that showed that this was um, significant in regards to um, preserving mortality. Oh, hang on, this is the wrong one. Anyway, um, there, over the course of time, has been a significant amount of research that's continued to go on regarding um, balanced solution. What we've realized, the major offender to that is chloride. You know, Rodeo, I think you downloaded the wrong PowerPoint of mine from 